Praise the Lord, everybody. What if you moved up a little closer and we got a little closer together since there are those that are not going to make the rapture because the rain fell. Yeah. Glad that you're here, all of you that are watching online. If I could get our brothers to please uh, uh, alert our climate conditions in the building and just have them check that for me, that would be marvelous. Now that you're nice and seated, let's stand together and have a word of prayer, shall we? Telling you what. might have to go uh, change religions where they go up and down, up and down and toss some candles or something to you. I don't know. Amen. That would not be good, would it? Some of you got it. Let's uh, have a word of prayer together, shall we? There's a number of names that are listed in front of you. And I'm just going to tell you that there's not a one of them that is not significant and needs you to intercede and stand in their behalf. And I don't know which one of you are going to hold the key in your prayers to the people that are on this list for the miracle in their behalf. But if you'll pray, God promises that he will answer. I'm going to try that on again. If you'll pray, God promises he will answer. And I, I know, and I don't have to back up from saying this, that God is always faithful to answer. Now, you may or may not like the answer he brings, but that's not the point. The point is, is that when you pray, God answers, and he will do it according to his will. As you have heard this past weekend, his purposes will prevail, regardless of what it looks like. I was talking with someone today that said, you know, the, the, the situation in the world is this and this, and I thought to myself of that scripture, man has plans, but God's purposes will prevail. So regardless of what's taking place, the Lord is in control. All we have to do is stand in the gap in faith and ask in faith believing, and the Lord does the rest. Is that all right for you? Amen. So let's do that together tonight over these needs. In fact, you might want to just uh, open your eyes when you pray and call the names of some of the folks that are listed there, whatever the Lord may lead you to pray and pray for them specifically, that God would give them the touch that they need in their body. Thank you tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we have the privilege to come to you, to be able to pray to the God of gods. You're not just one of many, and we're not having to search you out. You're the Lord who is present, a present help in time of trouble. And we believe tonight, mighty God, that your word has already declared that if we ask anything according to your will and your word, it shall be done. And so tonight, we stand in the gap of every person that is listed on this prayer sheet, people that are watching right now in this auditorium, many, God, that are suffering in their body, physically, Lord, some spiritually, some emotionally, Lord, even just in recent hours. Uh, God, we pray for the family of uh, the young 14-year-old that took his life this week. We pray, God, that you would just stand in the gap for them tonight. Let the angels of heaven go to where he is at, where the family is at tonight, Lord, and just undergird them and strengthen them. We believe right now, Lord, that when your word goes forth, it has the power to heal, save, and to deliver. So we send the word right now by the messenger angels of heaven, and we ask you to do what only you can do. We give you the glory for it right now, Lord, You've heard us before and answered, and you will again because you're that kind of God. We give you glory for it tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody believes it. Say a good amen. amen. Go find somebody to shake hands with and greet them in the name of the Lord. Would you do it? While I greet all of you that are joining us online, welcome to Pace Assembly Bible Class on a Wednesday night. We are thoroughly, thoroughly glad that you're joining us right now. There are people joining with us around the world. I can assure you the congregation of Pace Assembly is not confined to this house. You're part of it. If you're watching right now, you're a regular viewer, uh, you're counted as a part of the body of Christ right here at Pace, and we're glad that you are. Now help us get it out to other people and touch that share button where you're uh, watching on and get it out further than what uh, we're doing even now. And we thank you for participating. In a moment, you'll get a chance to be able to give uh, for our uh, 
for, for you being able to give tonight into the kingdom of God wherever you may be watching from, whether you're giving here or to your church that you're at right now. Let it happen as you respond to God and his word. He will respond, and I can assure you he will daily load you with blessings. So we thank you for joining with us. Get ready to be a giver. Amen. I want you to get ready to be a giver right here in this house. If you'll take time to take your smart device out or uh, the envelopes that are provided for you, cash in the, um, in the buckets in the back on your way out, you feel free to respond in any way that you feel comfortable. I promise you that um, we're not isolated. The other day I was doing business somewhere and they said, well, uh, we don't take checks anymore. I said, well, I hate that. You're not going to get mine then. Amen. So uh, we take all order, all forms, uh, and uh, watches, rings, property, houses, anything that you want to give up for the kingdom. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I, I can assure you that in this time that we're living in right now, you better make sure you're laying up treasures in heaven. Because thieves are breaking in and stealing stuff, and people are brokenhearted. But when everything you have belongs to God... Whatever takes place, he not only can replace it and restore it, uh, but he'll give you abundantly above whatever you could ask or think. Amen? How many of you know what I'm talking about right there? You've been that person. So let's believe God together tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to give. We recognize, Lord, that every, every gift, every gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. We thank you now, Lord, that you're uh, not a God that we have to back up to. We don't have to, Lord, beg the blessings of God. All we need to do is obey and have faith, and you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We thank you in advance for all of the blessings that come from you. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said a good amen. amen. God bless you tonight as you give into the kingdom. While that you're doing that, let me just mention to you, for all of you that are brand new or that you have not, uh, not attended uh, the starting point class, it will resume on the first Sunday in September. I know that's Labor Day weekend, but we're starting it up. We want to get as many classes as we can in before uh, the holidays hit. Can you imagine that I'm even saying that? Uh, disregard that I even just said it. Uh, but September the 4th on that uh, Sunday morning at 9 a.m., if you'd like to participate, you can sign up online or just show up on that first Sunday. If you have never become a member of Pace Assembly and you would like to or you'd just like to know more about Pace Assembly, I would encourage you to be in that class. There are, uh, there's a lot of information that you will get, and you can uh, be able to understand more about uh, what Pace Assembly is all about, what our mission is, uh, what are the things that are taking place. It will help you to have a clearer understanding. So we encourage you to be a part of the starting point class. And if you know someone who's brand new to the church uh, and would like to be able to know more about it, then feel free, please, to pass that word along. Help them know uh, that this starting point class will be starting up uh, on September the 4th at 9 a.m. You can ask any of the ushers or greeters when they come in the door, and they can direct you to the classroom where it is held over in the educational building. Also want to just remind you of the upcoming Prophecy Files. You'll see the information is out on social media as well, and we encourage you to share that out. I am um, uh, there's, a, there's so many things that I'm trying to bring into a funnel that is happening in our world today, some of which has just happened today that's going to affect all of our lives. You need to understand there's not a day that goes by that there's not something that is affecting our lives. And the good part about it is we don't have to be ignorant concerning what's happening. The Bible tells us what's going on and how we should respond uh, in this hour. First thing you need to know is, is that you don't need to be fearful. Amen? Amen. Come on, say amen for somebody next to you that's fearful. Okay? You don't need to be fearful. You don't need to operate in fear. We've seen that over the past two years where people have operated in absolute fear, and it's paralyzing. But I want you to know that the lion of the tribe of Judah is standing at the head of the line, and he's not afraid of anything that is a roar from the lion, the devil, who is a toothless little puppy. 
And I want you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's the reason why I bring this information to you and help you to understand the biblical application of what's going on in Bible prophecy. And I'm just going to ask you to, because I, I'm, I'm gathering a lot of information, of course, and I'll have the presentation coming, but there might be things on your heart and those of you that are watching that you would uh, like to see taken up, some subject, topic uh, that in Bible prophecy that you'd like to hear some more about or explanation about, uh, you can send that to my pastor at paceassembly.org, uh, send it in the email form, and uh, if it's possible, I'll incorporate it into this uh, prophecy files that's coming up on September the 11th. My hope is, is that I'll be able to have at least two before the end of the year. Uh, but I will tell you, Bible prophecy is happening faster than what we could ever imagine. And uh, there's just a lot of amazing things that are taking place. Um, even as I speak, there are people that are walking up the pilgrimage road that has recently been excavated in Israel that Jesus himself walked on and the pilgrims uh, walked up all the way up to Mount Moriah from the Pool of Siloam. There's a lot of things that are happening that are uh, incredible revelations that are happening, uh, revealing that God is doing, as well as things that would cause your own heart. If you didn't know the Lord, it would cause your heart to fear. And whenever I start reading this, and even just today, some of the parallels that are happening uh, that are in found in the Word of God and are happening in our society right now, uh, it's amazing how anybody would be caught off guard. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we should not be, he said, you should not uh, be a people who are ignorant concerning the times and the seasons. He wants us to know what's happening. And uh, I'm amazed at, 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 at pulpits that won't address it when it's right in front of you. Some of them may be scared. I don't know, but I ain't, I ain't afraid. I ain't scared. I can tell you right now, and I will not be. Because I know uh, what the Word of God is saying in this hour. And we need to be able to embrace it and then be able to tell other people about it. There's nothing like starting up a great conversation with somebody uh, about uh, the tribulation. Just open that book up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if, if you really want to get a crowd, just sit in a restaurant and start talking about the coming of the Lord. You, people will stop talking and listen to you. So um, I, I want you to make sure that you help get that word out. Let me share this little thing from you right here and from our wonderful friends from Brazos Valley, Texas, who asked us to pray. They asked us to pray for rain. If you remember, how many of you remember a couple of weeks ago, prayed on Wednesday night for rain. Well, by 10 o'clock that night, the weatherman was shocked. They were watching the weatherman who was shocked. 84 days of dryness in Texas. And, um, and by 10 o'clock, the report was coming from the weatherman, rain is on the way for the next seven days. Well, Sister Witham texted me um, that within the, uh, the next few days, and she said that some of her uh, parishioners that are out there said, please uh, thank Pastor Rogers, Pace Assembly, for praying for rain. Can you call him back and tell him we've had enough? <laughs> As if I had something to do with it. So um, this is, um, now this is, this is how specific and wonderful God is. They sent this email to us, and I've got to share it, and I know that they're watching tonight, but uh, they share, Roberta shared with us, it's funny that you say be specific when you pray because when uh, every Wednesday night about five minutes before church starts I open the service with prayer request and prayer for people and this past Wednesday night I said it very specifically Lord not a heavy flooding drench or sprinkle give us a slow soaking rain over a few days that was Roberta Juanita's uh, sister Pastor Juanita's daughter well praise God that's just what he did he gave us a good slow rain for seven days I was so shocked to hear about the flooding that we, if you've seen it in Dallas, I mean, they're pulling people out of cars and stuff. And she said, I told mom and my sister, I'm glad we were specific Wednesday when we prayed. God is so faithful to take care of his people. Amen. Come on, rejoice with them out there. Praise God. 
What a blessing that they are to us, and we're thrilled that they're watching tonight. And we're glad that you're here, and I'm glad that you didn't let a few raindrops keep you out. Uh, if it kept you out, you might be among the people who were outside of the ark when it started raining. So I um, welcome you to, we're changing the name tonight from Pace to the Ark. Here it is, right here. <laughs> welcome to the Ark. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to study it tonight. Now, would you just illuminate that word to our understanding? Give us, Lord, a, a download of your revelation knowledge. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be better disciples than what we were yesterday. We want to draw nearer to you. And you said when we make that response, you'll draw near to us. So let that happen, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said a good amen. amen. Now, uh, they have filled in the blanks for you and those of you that are watching. And part of that is to force your pastor to move on from number one to number four. So it has worked very effectively. I always liked review when I went to school, but you know, anyway, I'll move on. I want you to look in verse 33. Uh, I love my staff. I'm just telling you, they're, they're great. So Jesus has been speaking this, deci uh, this um, parable, and he's been talking and discipling his disciples. And the overview of the understanding here has to do with the fact that there is, you must put your mind and your heart in gear to be a disciple of the Lord because the potentials of it becoming very difficult to walk with the Lord and testify of the Lord are very, very high. In fact, it is a 100% chance that there's going to be persecution, tribulation, difficulty. Will there be blessing? Absolutely. Will, will, will there be, um, you know, converts? Will you, will you enjoy your, the journey and walk with them? Absolutely you will. But he wants to make sure that his disciples don't have some kind of fuzzy idea of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, you're seeing in our society right now how that there for the longest, everybody wanted to be, you know, we want to thank God for this award at the academy or whatever that it was. But now you're seeing that absolutely fade away and a persecution that is coming towards those that name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, rest assured, if you name the name of God uh, and you talk in general terms, most likely you'll be able to get by because the world cares nothing about you worshiping God. But the moment you step out of the crowd and identify that God as Jesus Christ, you have just set yourself apart from every other God. In fact, the Bible says that God has given him a name that is above every other name. So when you name the name of Christ, see, they didn't, they didn't outlaw prayer at football games until you started saying, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you won't be outlaw, outlawed until you start using the name of Jesus in public, and you're in good company. Peter and John were thrown in jail because they used the name of Jesus. They were beaten by those that were uh, the, the lawmakers and so forth because they used the name of Jesus when they prayed the prayer that raised up the man at the gate beautiful and so forth and so on. They were beaten for using the name of Jesus as his disciples. Now, why is that important? Because you and I better count the cost of serving the Lord. Because it will not, and you hear me tonight because a lot of people don't want to tell you this, but I'm just telling you, it's not going to get easier to serve the Lord from between now and the coming of the Lord. Now, don't mistake what I'm saying because some people will say, well, you know, but what, Pastor, it's not that hard. Well, here's my question. Are you, are you displaying Christ? Are you out there? 
with your faith and with your witness? Or are you walking incognito and nobody knows that you're a Christian? Because in a moment, I'm going to talk about you. It's, it's right here in the, in the book, in Luke 14. Y'all got your Bibles open to Luke 14? Now, Jesus has spoken about discipleship. He's spoken about uh, make sure that, that you understand the cost involved, and that is if you hate your mother and father, sister, brother, if you don't do that, you can't meet by a disciple. He says uh, which person tries to build a building and they don't count the cost. They laid the foundation and everybody mocks them because they started out saying, hey, I'm a Christian, and then they fail. They went back. So he says you need to count the cost because it's not going to be easy. Not going to be easy. And then he comes down to verse number 33. And I'm just going to tell you that the more you walk with the Lord, the deeper the commitment that you and I have to make. Now, you don't have to question Jesus' commitment. He died for you. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He died for you. He, he, he was beaten for you and for me. He was nailed to a cross. He was stripped naked for your shame. How many of you know sin brings shame? Amen. If you don't feel pain, pain is to the body uh, what guilt is to the spirit. So when you, it's not wrong to feel guilty for sin because that's, that's what comes with it. And when the Holy Spirit convicts you, which you should pray, Lord, uh, keep convicting me, deal with my heart, not condemn me. The Holy Spirit will never condemn you. The devil condemns, but the Holy Spirit will always convict. There will be a sense of guilt. And if you're living for the Lord and you, don't, and you want to please the Lord and you know that it breaks his heart whenever you don't please the Lord, then there is associated shame that comes. But I want you to know when Jesus died on the cross, he took the guilt, he took your sin, and he took your shame. So when they stripped him naked, they, sh they were attempting to shame him. He wasn't hanging up on the cross with a loincloth. They stripped him naked. And everybody, his mother, everybody else saw him at 33 years old. Marred to such a degree that the Bible says he was unrecognizable. And they tried to shame him. Now, he would have been shamed if he would have listened to the religious people come down from the cross and then we'll believe you. He would have shamed himself, he would have shamed his father, and he would have shamed the kingdom of God and everything he would have done for 33 and a half years would have been for naught. But Jesus said, I'm gonna stay right here. And the, the Bible says he took, he, in Isaiah, he bore our shame and our sorrows and was acquainted with grief all of these things that he bore upon himself now why am I telling you that because there is no price that you and I will pay in serving the Lord or sacrifice made that will be any higher than that when people say oh that's just too much oh you're just asking too much you know uh, tithe that's just too much. Serve the Lord, serve people, you know, witness, all that. That's just too much. Somebody got in my face, Pastor. Somebody cussed me out. Okay? All the way down, the, just whatever it is, you pick it. It will happen. But you must always remember, he bore my grief and my sin, my sorrow and my shame. And when you compare what you're going through to what he went through, it'll cause you to get back in the game and go again. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. Is that all right for you out there? Yes, so there will always be a deeper commitment that the Lord wants you to step into, and this is where it comes to down in the crux of this entire parable in, in these last three verses. Verse 33, so likewise... Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, 
He cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears, let him hear. All right, so let's take this up tonight. We talked to you about these other things, and there's much more of certainly that, that we could dig into, but I want you to look at number four here tonight. Um, where are we going? Let's go back. There it is. Following Jesus is more, he is telling us here in verse number 33, he's telling us it is more than material gain. In other words, he's putting the comparison on us here in verse number 33 to say that your love for me will require you to be able to set everything else aside for me. Why did he tell us to count the cost? Because that is what it's going to cost us. So let me, as I was, as I was preparing for this and thinking about it before service, let me put this illustration on you or this, this question. Get this. How much of what you have right now are you going to carry with you to heaven? How's that nice car? How, what about the house, uh, the, the, the money, uh, the clothes? You, you got anything? Okay, when you have that kind of mentality, like Job, naked I came into the world and naked I'm going out then the enemy can't have a hold in your life because you have taken everything and put it on the altar. Now, you back it all the way up to previous verses. He said, put your mother, your father, sisters, and brothers on that altar too. Put all your material gain, everything you've become, your success in life, your, your incredible business. Now, in James, he says, that's one reason why that the rich man is not able to make it into the kingdom because of his great riches. Now, I'm going to show you something here in a minute. God ain't concerned about the riches. He's not worried about you having riches. He's worried about those riches having you. Not that he's worried, but he's looking at, are you being controlled by it as an idol, or are you, are you controlling it? Are you willing to lay it aside? So he asked the rich young ruler, uh, have you kept all the law? Yeah, I've done that since, since I was born. You know, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, okay, sell all you have and come follow me. There's a requirement. Why? He touched the Isaac of his heart. He touched the thing that was nearest to him, his finances, his money. I submit to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus, who knows everything, looked all the way down into our year of 2022 and said, the problem that they're going to have is with material things and money. And so more than two-thirds of the parables that Jesus speaks about, he deals with material things, money, finances. Why? Because he is, he is wanting us to break free from worshiping at the idol of material things. And that is not, that is not always easily left behind are you with me out there so this is an application in this verse right here that sums up the parable that Jesus is speaking about and I want you to notice let me let me give you this real quick that nothing nothing in life can take the place of fulfilling your God-given assignment so nothing should stop you from fulfilling. We've been talking about assignment. You be back here Sunday morning, the Lord willing. I'm going to get back into that. I, I, only, I only just drew out a little bit. I, I'm excited to get back here and get the rest of it to you because, because if, we don't, if, we, if we spend 70 years on this earth and we don't accomplish what God sent us here to do, what good is it? Well, I made a lot of money or I had a lot of friends or I, you know, this or I, that, whatever. But how many people are dying for lack of purpose that God called them to? Empty. I've gained it all. Now what? Solomon, the richest man that's ever lived, said, I've got it all, and it is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. 
What a striking statement. But today, that's not on the lips of people. What do you want? More? We have even, this might rub the cat here backwards, we have even succumbed to that kind of a spirit in the church. And I hear this prayer, and don't get me wrong, but I hear this prayer. More, Lord. Now, I understand the heart of somebody who's seeking the Lord and wants, you know, wants to draw near to the Lord, but, but here's my question out of all of that. For what do you want more? If he never blessed you with anything else, will this is what this parable is speaking of. Will you serve him if he never touches and blesses your life again? Are you hearing me? Yes, now you're hearing what it takes to be a disciple. And you may not think that right now, but I promise you there are people that are watching around the world right now who don't have half as much as you have. Oh, yeah. right. Watch what I'm telling you. Now I asked him a little while ago because I could feel I have this serious sensory thing when I step into the pulpit. Of, and my staff knows of lights being out and music and sound and air conditioning and all that kind of stuff because I know how it affects everybody out here. I can see it on your faces when it gets too warm. <laughs> and it isn't because I preached long. 15 minutes in, you are down because suddenly it got warm in here or, or whatever. The conditions are not right. That, somebody, why is it so cold in here? Cause got to keep it sharp right why is this so important uh, uh, about because if I turned the air off in here and we had to walk in here and serve the Lord without air I'm not getting very many takers right now because we want our comfort do we not y'all better talk to me somebody we want our comfort we want our comfort. We want what we want. And, oh, Lord, I'll serve you if. And we drop all these conditions on the Lord. But I want you to know something. The Lord requires of us to put it all on the line. I, you know, my dad was in, in, the, in the power company for all these years, but he was a lay minister, lay pastor at a number of different churches and so forth. And I think he might have had two suits, maybe. Dry cleaning them, it wasn't even the thought. We just, you know, hang it up, mom would, and try to, he didn't sweat half as much as I do, I can tell you. <laughs> but I've known preachers that have only had one suit. They go do what they do. Uh, you'll you'll want to be here I'm, as we are getting ready, uh, Lord willing, and, and, and we arrive at November uh, on, the, on the weekend of the um, Pace Family Fest, which we've been really gearing up. You're not going to want to miss it, by the way. It's going to be incredible. You'll see more stuff coming, but uh, um, I'm going to be bringing a message that's going to help you to understand the history of this church. And, and the very first pastor, Brother McGraw, who came here as a circuit-riding preacher would walk from Alabama all the way down here to minister to this congregation and he would make it to the next location. Walk. If you had to walk to church, would you do it? In the rain? Come on, somebody. But my hair, Pastor. Listen, I'm just telling you, I was raised in the time when them slap benches, y'all don't know what I'm talking about, you sit in them slap benches, Okay, they were not comfortable. You ain't got no lumbar support, no padding on the bottom end of that thing. And, it, and, it, and if somebody sat at the other end of that thing and it wasn't nailed down, you were the first one to know. <laughs> Sawdust, all that kind of stuff. A few weeks ago, I, I went up to McClellan where Dad would go and uh, way up in the woods up here. I'm, all, I'm almost to Alabama. And, and that's the place on Easter Sunday morning I discovered as a small child I'd never been exposed to an outhouse before. 
the other day when I was up there, I stopped by and took some pictures of it and even walked down the hill where the outhouse was and had a moment. <laughs> had a moment down there, right there. The old, uh, Brother Legero, the old outhouse is gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. The old outhouse is gone, you know. <laughs> But I remember there was no singing and lights and people got together and took those hymn books out and beat the cover off of them and, and made noise until one Sunday when Dad was preaching there on one Sunday, the doors opened to that little church and in the back door, some of you may know the name and I mention it, country music star Hank Lachlan walked through the door walked down to the aisle, uh, down the aisle and gave his life to Jesus Christ after Amen. dad got through preaching. Yeah. He lived right across the street from the church up there. I'm saying to you, my friends, that we really need to count the cost because when you think about the Ukrainian Christians and the, and the Chinese Christians and the, and the North Korean Christians and the Russian Christians and so forth, we must wrap our mind around the fact that we are not the only ones serving the Lord, and I can assure you the luxury in which we serve the Lord today we should really look at because the Bible says unless we are willing to lay it all down for his sake, we cannot be his disciple. And that should be a heart check for each and every one of us periodically. Lord, what is it that I have that I couldn't give up if you called right now? Because you're going to give it up. But the worst thing in the world would be to have your heart still attached to something and you take your last breath. I want to serve the Lord like Paul, who when it was all said and done, he said, I, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I can say that I did everything that I was supposed to do. So I want you to look at something, underline this little word right here because it's important for you. Verse 33, so likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. Forsaketh, underline that word, forsaketh. You've heard me say this before. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. That's physical nor forsake you that's emotional and mental so the Lord is not talking about you selling everything you've got in order to be his disciple we found out that people do that and they've listened to all kinds of false doctrines and con artists that you know sell all you got meet me on the mountain we're going to wait for Jesus to come and they were just foolish Jim Jones, come on down here, fly down to, to, to down here in Johannesburg and, and, you know, all this kind of nonsense. That's nonsense. He's not talking about you selling everything you got. Now, let me say this to you. you. There should be a level of personal conviction in your life that if the Lord requires it, you lay it down. Come on, somebody. That's a sacrifice. And, and, and I want to say to you, that sacrifice is not the same for everyone. Are y'all getting this teaching here tonight? He may require something of you that he doesn't require of me. So don't try to make me fall up underneath your conviction. Come on, somebody. Well, the Lord told me not to drink any more coffee. Well, that's fine and dandy, but... Come on, am I right? Where are my coffee drinkers in the house out here? Look at you. I can't even get an amen out of y'all right now. You're so mad right now. You're thinking there's going to be a, 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 you know, a coffee ban. I mean, if you wanted to really start a revival, I should go down there to Starbucks and tell them there'll be no more Starbucks. You see some people tensing up and shaking and frothing at the mouth and everything. The word forsake here is a key, key word for us because... He says, except you forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. So remember, forsaking has to do with mentally, spiritually. It's a spiritual application. It's an emotional application. In other words, don't let your heart, you should be able to forsake anything emotionally, physically, mentally, 
for the sake of Christ. Don't be so attached. Now, what is that called in the Bible? That's called idols, idol worship. When you set something before the Lord, it's an idol. Something before the Lord. So he talks about mother, sister, father, brother, all that. And then he comes down and just, just blankets the whole thing. Unless you lay aside everything for my sake, you can't be my disciple. He said, what I don't want you doing is having something that would become an idol in your life so much that you would choose that over me. Are you all with me right here? So he says, you must willingly be ready to forsake all of that or you cannot be my disciple. Now understand this. All that live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, shall suffer persecution. The key is not that you're going to not suffer persecution. The key is will you remain godly through the persecution and keep on living godly? That is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So things cannot become idols. And many times we even place people in that position. I, I'm your pastor and I appreciate your appreciation. So does my wife. But I'm just going to tell you, don't ever put me on some pedestal. I'm not God. There may be times when, when, when I pray for you and the Lord heals you and so forth. Don't put me in that position. Honor and respect the office as the scripture tells us to do. But, but, but don't put anybody in that position. Amen. We've got a divide in our country right now politically because people have idolized individuals yeah. and not honored individuals. There's a difference between idolizing them and honoring them. Are you all with me right there? So... He says, he says to us, don't let anything become an obstacle between me and you. Because why? Because you don't own any of it. You want to know how much you own? Ask somebody the day after you're dead. Are you hearing what I'm saying? People are going to come around and scratch and claw and if it's not written in the will, you're going to see people that were loving and hugging and kissing and crying on one another turn into vultures over a $5 bill. I want to watch. Now, you think I'm crazy, but there is a preacher this past week who railed at his congregation because they did not give him a very expensive watch that he wanted for a pastor appreciation gift. <laughs> you ain't no pastor. Really? We've got to check our hearts, ladies and gentlemen. We just have to check our hearts. And that doesn't need to be something that, that is just a one-time occasion. It has to be a regular deal. Now, look at these last two verses because he makes this analogy between salt and salt that has lost its savor. This is very important to kind of wrap up this entire lesson here. Salt, he says, he says in verse number 34, salt is good. How many of y'all know salt's good? Four people know salt is good. I bet you if I took it away right now, you'd say, where's my salt? I know salt's good around our house. Amen. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its savor, I've lost his savor, his savor. Wherewith shall it be seasoned? And then he goes on to say, it, it's, it's good for nothing. It's, it's, it's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Now, I'm just telling you, folks. Come on, let's break this down. Let's not read over it. He says right here, it's not good for the land and it's not even good for the dunghill, but men cast it out. And I'm going to show you why this is. He that hath the ear, let him hear. So watch this. He's talking about salt. Now, in other passages of Scripture, Jesus has said that, that we are, as disciples of the Lord, are to be salt and light in the earth. And salt has so many different properties that are so spiritually uh, uh, applicable to us, you know, it's a, as a preservative, as, as a healing agent, all that kind of stuff. Everybody's finding out what salt can do. And that's wonderful. And it has all those wonderful properties. In the Word of God, there is the salt covenant. Many times I'll perform that ceremony in a wedding ceremony, the salt covenant. 
The reason why they would make the statement that you're not worth your weight in salt was that your value had degenerated and decreased to such a degree that the payment wasn't worth what you were giving me. That's the reason why we don't buy no salt at our house. What a waste of money. Well, pastor, I got this and I got that. Listen, salt that is no salt is no salt. Why would, you, why would you mentally have anguish with a, with a little salt shaker there that says no salt? Just forget it. Don't even put it on the table. Don't buy it, right? You, you and I understand that. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying if you've lost your saltiness, there's no ability to make the flavor of whatever that it is come out. And, and I submit to you tonight that the church is in a place where we have lost saltiness to such a degree as a preservative for this world that we're watching the implosion of this world because the church refuses to be salty anymore. We want to get along like a no-salt church. We don't want to have any controversy. We don't want, to, we don't want anything to irritate. Doesn't salt irritate? But it also heals, doesn't it? So, so Jesus is saying here, if the salt has lost its savor, what is he saying? He's saying it is, it, is, it is the degeneration of the mind and the spirit that makes you useless in the kingdom. When you have lost your effectiveness to influence the lives of people for my sake because you have become so nominal in what you call your relationship with the Lord, that you don't affect change anywhere. Salt affects change. How many of you know what I'm talking about? More salt affects more change, right? And too much salt can ruin it. Come on, that's a whole teaching all by itself. So salt without a savor then, he's saying, without, without the effectiveness, without the properties of salt on the inside of it, has no value. So, people that claim to be disciples who have lost their saltiness, rather, rather than, be a, than be a part of Jesus Christ, they choose to be a part of the world so easily. We're watching this happen. And the salt loses its value, it loses its virtue, and, and it's, there's no, he's saying there is no good left in it. Now, this is such a, a lot of times we read this and we go, well, there can be a recovery. But based on this scripture right here, once the salt has lost its ability to produce a change, the Bible, Jesus said it is good for nothing. Now that is a, I want you to look at that here tonight because somehow we feel like that we are as disciples can go through this world and not affect change like we are called to do, like our assignment is, we didn't get dirty today with any sinners or we didn't, you know, whatever that it may be. And somehow we feel like that God's going to be accepting of that. But you've got to ask yourself the question, have I lost my saltiness? Have I won anybody to the Lord? Have I, have I affected change in the life of someone? Have I, have I spent time to pray with them? Have I discipled anybody? Am I evangelistic in my approach? Or am I just doing what the world does? Go into the store, get my groceries, go home, and hopefully I won't see anybody. See, my wife don't like to take me shopping. Grocery store, anywhere else. And, and I can tell you, as a, as a full-grown man, that ain't a problem for me. However... On the occasion that I go, she said, I'm going in this store, and I don't want you looking around. She said, now stop it, honey. you're going to owe me five bucks. But I mean, I understand what she's saying. I need to get in there, and I need to get my groceries. You know, that's what we're going for. But I'm, I'm horrible, because I'll walk around, Hey, how y'all doing? Now, she's willing to do that, but she's on a mission. I'm not on the mission. 
All of you men are jelly-backed in this building tonight. Ain't helping me none. Here I am out here hanging out here to dry. Yeah, come on now. <laughs> yeah, you preaching good. I ain't even going to go on with that one right there because that one just get me in trouble and y'all won't be nowhere in my house tonight to rescue me. You wouldn't do it in here. I'm leaving. I'm gone. No, I, I mean, that's just, you know, I'll do that at traffic lights. So I ask her, would you stop looking over? <laughs> All that kind of, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware of my surroundings, but she keeps me in check. Amen. Go in, get the gallon of milk, come out. Why, why is this so important that we, are, that we are salty in the world that we're in? Because, you know, I, I truly believe that my life and your life as a, as a Christian, as a believer, is not some arbitrary Jesus just throws us out there and says, just do your thing. I truly believe that there's not a day that goes by that God doesn't set up an encounter with you with someone in your daily operation. I mean, she's going to grocery store and so forth, but she's going to, I can tell you right now, if she goes to the same grocery store just like y'all do, there's always going to be that encounter somewhere, somehow, with or without me. <laughs> so what's the point? I don't believe that, I don't believe we're here by fate. I don't believe I got saved just to get saved and go to heaven. I truly believe in the order of the Lord and whatever, whatever I'm doing and wherever I am, there is going to be a, an intentional thing that God is going to set me up with that it doesn't mean that I'm going to stop and start speaking in tongues in the middle of the aisle and you know, shake their head and, and you know they fall out in the onion pile. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that there's going to be an occasion where you might just drop a seed. There's been more times than not that we've been at the grocery store or whatever that may be, and somebody come up, and, and we start, we just stop, and we just pray with them right there in the salad aisle. Okay? That needs to be the common part of your life as a disciple. Thank you for that. I was getting really lonely up here. So here's what he says. He says in verse number five, he said, or, or verse 34, he says, wherewith shall it be seasoned? This statement is a very powerful statement right here. Wherewith shall it be seasoned? What he is saying right now is this. Once it's lost its savor, there is no recovery from it. Now, that's a powerful thought. Once it's lost its savor, there is no recovery for it. Why? Because he goes into the next verse and says, because, because it is so then rejected. And watch what I'm telling you. There's nothing this world hates worse than a Christian who calls himself a Christian and acts like a heathen. Now, forget, let me take it out of here. There's nothing in this world that this world hates worse than a pastor, evangelist, preacher who calls himself such but operates like a guy who's got to have a watch from his congregation. And why is this world disillusioned and why are people walking out of the church? It's because the salt has lost its savor. Now, you tell me, have you ever tried to get that salt that you bought, that you, that you put it in water or whatever it is, have you ever tried to redeem that and get it back salty again? And in the Oh, there's something that God knows that we didn't, right? He says here, he says, how is it going to get seasoned again? Once it's lost it, you can't get it back. Now, that's a powerful statement. Pastor, where's the redemption in that? He's saying, I want you to understand how critically important you, when you call yourself a disciple, that you don't turn around and go back. Count the cost, because somebody's going to get in your face. 
Somebody's not going to like your Jesus. Somebody's not going to like what you do. Be prepared to get mocked. Be prepared to have your own family reject you. Be prepared for all of that. And if you get prepared for that and you're still seasoned when you, all, when you come out, then you're my disciple. Because if you lose it, he said, it's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. But watch this line. But men cast it out. Now, why is that so important? Why do men cast it out? Why do people get rid of it, get away from it? Because there is the danger of you as a salty Christian hanging around a non-salty Christian that can cause infection. Why is the salt put into the wound anyway? To stop the infection. But if you put no salt or salt that's lost its savor into the wound, it doesn't heal it. It doesn't do anything. In fact, it can make it worse. So men cast it out because they don't want that infection to get inside of them. Now, this is the determining factor of Jesus here, who when he says this to his disciples, he's saying, listen, you need to count the cost, you need to understand why you're serving me, and then you need to understand that what you're doing is not some Sunday and Wednesday night gathering together to study the Bible. You're to be salt every day of your life. And and now, how do I become more salty? What you're doing right now is, is creating the salt. Amen. When we walked around in the Dead Sea in Israel and uh, put mud all over ourselves from that salt, it has a healing agent in it. It's so thick with salt. Now, nothing lives because there's too much there. No fish, no vegetation, nothing. But the mud is sold just up the hill some of you may have bought it. What, what's the name of it, Rita? Uh, I, I, I starts with an A. Something like that. Yeah. Ahavi. That's what it is. Ahava. Ahava. If you've ever seen Ahava, that's straight from the Dead Sea. It has a healing agent in it minerals and all kinds of things. They dig it up and sell it like crazy. All you women out there. That's salt. I promise you, because you get down in that mud and you start putting that mud all over you, it starts drawing out the impurities. Now you got to drink water again because it'll it'll wear you out because you put that salt on you. And so it's underneath your feet is like rock salt. It's like pouring out of boxes and boxes of rock salt all over the place and it's constantly reproducing that rock salt down there because it's in the environment of it it's getting replenished it's making people money the factory is right up the hill from where we were they go out there and dig it up process it put it in a tube and sell it to women and to men I found it to be the greatest shaving cream that's ever been oh I'm telling you all that other stuff burns like fire this stuff goes on smooth and gives me the greatest shape ain't that something salt salt but if it loses its savor you're done you can't replenish it God is trying to replenish you right now because this world is so messed up that if the church if the church doesn't have what it needs to be able to be the preservative and the healing agent and all of the things that the properties of salt is to this world isn't it amazing isn't it amazing that Jesus didn't say pepper is good (laughs) come on somebody he could have picked anything out but salt because of, of all the properties, because he knew better than us. So you have to be careful about hanging around people with no salt because they'll bring you down. Are you all with me? The, the, you'll get infected. 
And I'm just telling you right now, I'm pre I've been preparing this staff, I've been preparing other people, and I want to say this to you, all of you that are out here. You be careful what you listen to, where you go, who you listen to. I'm saying that as your pastor. Because I promise you right now, in, in recent weeks, I've had to use both ends of my, of my shepherd's staff. And I ain't scared for that either. Because if a wolf gets loose in here and takes you away or starts talking in your ear false doctrine right. Right. that could be your eternal soul ladies and gentlemen and I will give an account for that so some I've been able to take the hook and pull them out and the others old wolf comes along he don't get the hook why? why? because I love you too much to let something infect your spirit and you better guard yourself and your kids. And I don't care if it's CRT or, or whatever that it may be out there because Christians must stand in this day and be salt, whether it's here or in the school system or on your job or wherever that it may be. Can you say amen to that tonight? Come on, put your hands together for that. Okay, so we're racing to the end. And here is characteristics of a Christ-like disciple. This is what it's supposed to look like. First of all, Following Christ is an ongoing transformation of becoming like Christ in character and in purpose. You find that right there in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. So the, the, don't think because you have, yeah, please, I, I'm, I'm ordained, I, I, all that kind of stuff, but that doesn't mean that I've arrived. I don't care if you got DD behind your name, PhD, FBI, CIA, I don't care what you are. There's a transformation that will be ongoing until Jesus comes, and then you will even be transformed on the day that he does arrive. Can you say amen to that? Write this down. Following Christ is doing the right thing for the right reason. Let me say the righteous thing for the righteous reason. Philippians 1.27, only let your conversation be as becoming the gospel of Christ. That whether I come, now watch this, Paul's saying this, whether I come and see you or else be absent. This is the key. I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. What's he saying here? I want you to have integrity. I want you to do the righteous thing for the right reason, whether I'm there watching you or not. It's easy to sit in here and be a Christian, is it not? But when you go out there on your job tomorrow or whatever, you're going to be required just as much to do the right thing for the right reason. And sometimes people are willing to do just a little compromise, and the next thing you know, that little compromise goes to a little bit more compromise, and then a little bit more compromise right how many of you can eat a half a scoop of ice cream and be satisfied three of you the rest of you have absolutely no control am I right about it come on I, don't worry about it I'm talking to myself too that's the reason why I tell her don't bring that rocky road home don't bring that rocky road home because I'll eat the half of the container. Briars loves me. Right? Why? Because, I mean, it's, uh, come on, everybody's got their thing, right? Everybody's got their kryptonite. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Can you identify your kryptonite? <laughs> you liars. Can you identify your kryptonite? Come on, wave your hand at me if you know what your kryptonite is. All right? Now, if you don't know what your kryptonite is, go watch Superman, all right? Kryptonite. <laughs> It's the thing that no matter how strong you think you are, and everybody's got it. Oh, believe me. He said, I want you to be righteous whether I'm with you or without you. Amen. How many of you know that's Christ-like right there? Amen. Number three, following Christ is a progressive, is, is progressive in nature. What does that mean? He said, abide in me, verse uh, 4 of chapter 15 of John. Abide in me, and I in you as much as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide, stays, faithful, connected, committed to the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. Remember the progressiveness of this entire chapter. What does he say? He said, I want you to have fruit, 
And then he said, I want you to have more fruit, and then I want you to have much fruit. So there's three stages of the growth pattern right here. And in between each stage, there's a pruning. Now, nobody likes the pruning. Nobody likes the pruning, but in order for you to get to more fruit, something's going to have to be cut off. We got these, uh, what do you call those, uh, friscatties, something in the backyard? Magnolia friscatties, they're incredible. They got the little, uh, they smell like little bananas and all, we got two of them right there in the backyard. And, and, and last year, she said, I want you to go out there and cut that, cut that thing down. We need to get it. So I went out there and I cut it deep. It sat there and looked like it was going to die. But she's got the thumb. She's got the green thumb. How many of you understand right now I'm doing a makeup right here. I'm trying to make up. <laughs> this service is almost over with and I'm trying to do what, because she's already passed a note over here to the Godens and I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> She don't think I see that stuff, but I see that stuff. I can see all y'all. I see all y'all balancing your checkbook and watching Netflix right now. I'm just telling you. So I'm doing my best because in a moment, I'm going to get in that car with her. We're going home. It's going to be raining, so I can't walk. So I need y'all's prayers. I need y'all to pray with me. Hold me up. Magnolia Friscatis is where I was at. And so I cut them things down. And, and, and this past weekend, I, I went out there on the back porch and I looked out there and I said, Rita, look at them things. They've grown back into a, in a, into a, beautiful, into a beautiful plant. Almost like if you took a hedge trimmer, went out there and just shaped them. They're just grown. And it won't be long before those things have some blooms pop on them. Because the Lord knows exactly where to cut us, doesn't he? Now, I don't want you cutting me, and, 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 and I don't want to even be cutting you, right? right? Come on, because you don't know where to cut, and you'll cut too deep, or you'll cut too shallow, and either I'll lose my fruit. Come on, somebody. And if you stay half-connected, you ever seen anything stay half-connected? I got a picture of it. We took a picture of our little, that little blueberry bush out there, and one of the limbs had broken down, but it wasn't completely disconnected. It was just broken, but it was broken enough. Now watch this. This is a sermon all by itself. I'm going to drop this on you, and you can preach it yourself. So this limb falls down, Brother Neff, and it's still connected, so it still has leaves on there, and it even produces fruit, blueberries. She goes out there. She's picking some of the blueberries, and she picks one of those, starts to pop it in her mouth. She does, and it's hard like a rock and bitter. Ooh, preach that right there halfway connected not good enough to even be eaten and even bitter when I do so we had to sever that otherwise it would have affected it was taking oh God from the rest of the bush and its ability to produce so the Lord says we're going to have to whack this and cut this and shape this but don't worry you're going to cry a little bit when you go through a cutback Anybody been through a cutback? I lost my job, Pastor. I lost some money. I lost this. I lost that. Well, you didn't lose it as long as it's in the hands of the master. Come on, somebody. He knows where the fruit's going to come. And if you'll just stay with the Lord, and all I got to do, he said, is abide. I, I mean, how does a tree abide? How does a fruit tree abide? Does it sit there and go, mm, abide, abide, I'm staying, I'm staying? No, it just stands there. It just stays. Come on, somebody. Pastor, I don't know how my marriage is going to work. Just stay. Come on, somebody. It's going, to go, it's going to go through this. It's going to go through that. Come on. And if you're like me, you can make trouble all by yourself. Come on, somebody. And then who counsels the pastor and his wife? I mean, number four, following Christ. <laughs> Preoccupied. Uh, following Christ is a work of grace. Isn't that wonderful? Somebody ought to say, thank God for grace. Because you don't always follow Christ, do you? Come on, somebody. Pulled up at the traffic light, pulled in here tonight. Somebody had your parking place. It's the one I park in. That one right there. They knew that I parked there every week. And I needed it tonight more than ever because it was raining outside. Come on, somebody. You ought to thank God for grace because grace, grace 
Grace keeps the door open. <laughs> Ooh, don't let me get on that. What does he say in Philippians 2.13? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of what? Of his good pleasure. You know, the reason why that we need grace is because somewhere we got off track and started doing our own thing, and he allows, grace allows us to get back doing his good pleasure. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Having nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, rather train yourself, train yourself to be godly. I mean, you know, that's a process. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Isn't that a power? Don't you love the way that reads right there? Number five, look at this. Following Christ always manifests itself in ministry to others. This is the reason why I don't understand. Jesus said, I I've not come for myself. I've come to serve others. He was teaching his disciples to be selfless. Because if it's all about you, if oh, I just got to get to church so I can get my blessing, well, what are you going to do with that blessing? And I promise you, the Lord can't bless you if you're still full from last week's blessing. But the moment you take the lid off of yourself and pour yourself out on somebody else, no matter how much it is, and then you come back, it makes, it makes Wednesday night and Sunday and every time we get together more valuable because I have a need that only the Lord can supply. So I take this and I hold it up, fill me up, Lord. And he said, yeah, you used it up. Come on, I'm going to fill you up. And then you go out and you pour it out all over the place on dry and thirsty ground. You come back and say, now, Lord, I need you to fill me up. He said, I can trust you with this. Let me fill you up again. Don't come back to a service like this. Don't come back to church like this. If you've come back to church, if you went from this church on Sunday and the lid is still on and you still have everything you got, you missed your purpose and calling because this, that blessing was not about you. Right. Have you ever seen a, a, a bottle of water drink itself? That's not a trick question. <laughs> the answer is no. The answer is no. No. Have you ever seen a tree eat its own fruit? No. What's the fruit for? It's for the person who comes to enjoy, to be blessed by the fruit. Well, wait a minute. The tree did all the work. What do they get out of it? It is more blessed. There it is. Now, you got a sermon right here. You go tell people that are stuck on wanting another blessing, what have you done with the one you got? Come on now. And then you ought to take a picture of this water bottle and put it all over social media and say, don't come back to church like this. Because all this right here is meant to fill you and refill you, edify you, strengthen you, pour the word of God in you, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. But there's a world out there that's thirsty. And you hold the water. I said, you hold the water. You hold the water. A 14-year-old kid stuck a gun to his head this past week. And he had come right here to this youth group. It's affected a lot of the kids at Pace High School. They're dealing with it up there right now. 14 years old. Lost hope. Family's grieving. Pastor, what do we do? We did the same thing they're doing up there tonight. And I told Pastor Taylor earlier today, I said, don't you ever get tired of preaching about the blood, about the cross, about the love of God, and keep giving them that altar call. Because we don't need woo-woo. Y'all understand woo-woo? Where everybody comes in and we all got this feeling and everything is wonderful and we walk out the door and for what? We need, the world needs the water. Yeah. And you have the water of life. And it's not just water. Jesus said, I'm not just water. I am living. Ooh. I'm living water. Let's get this right here. 
following Christ is intended to be reproductive. What does he tell us? Matthew 28, 19 is the great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Do you know right now, while I'm standing on this platform in Pace, Florida, that through the cameras that are broadcasting around this world, that this gospel message, this love of Jesus Christ, this discipleship message is going all around the world. And anytime anybody clicks in, and they don't have to even be doing it in the same time zone, on demand, they can click it at any moment and get the message. Why? Why now? Why not 20 years ago? Because we're living in the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of this right here. And the call of God upon any gospel preaching church is not to be the consumers of more blessing. We are to be the reproducers, a reproductive, giving birth all of the time to new converts. And then to disciple them. That's what this is all about. I, I want to encourage you to find people who are looking for something they don't know what they're looking for. I promise you the answer is Jesus that they're looking for, all right? It's not another drink. It's not another party. It's not this or that. It is going to be that Jesus Christ on the inside of you is the answer. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You ever, you ever worn a hat that was a one-size-fits-all? You know why? Because whoever, what, however how big or small your head is, fits. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. And if you'll give people Jesus, I can promise you whatever their problem is, it's one size fits all. Jesus is the answer to every, every problem that people have. Here's the last one. Following Christ is centered around the life of fellowship with other believers. Isn't that powerful? Now, what does he tell us in Hebrews? He said, don't forsake. Don't forsake. Remember that word? What does forsake mean? Emotionally, spiritually, in your mind. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Leaving is physical. Forsaking is emotional, it is mental. So he says, don't get me out of your mind. Don't get me out of your spirit. Don't, you, well, I'm here, pastor. Do you know a lot of people attend church, but they've forsaken church, sitting right in the church? They haven't left it. They're just not participating. They're not engaging. I will just tell you, it's of no value to you. Go do something. You probably never heard a pastor tell you that before in your life. When you come, I'm going to tell you my prayer before you got here tonight. Lord, let the people that come on Wednesday night, which I already knew is going to be raining, and people are going to be looking on the radar, and they went, hmm, man, I might get wet. I think maybe next week, whenever they do come, I'll just spray some water on them just in case. <laughs> That's the hateful side of me. Y'all pray for me. I'm trying to get sanctified. I'm going to tell you, with two years of being isolated, two years of being to yourself, and even to this day, even to this day, people are standing. You let somebody cough around you. Like they've got the plague. It's gotten in our head. And let me tell you what it's done to the church. It's fragmented the church to such a degree and shaken it so, so much that people now, now, never mind, they'll pack out the stadiums to 100,000. But coming to church, Pastor, I, I don't want, you know, we sit so close. Are you kidding me? Taylor had jury duty this week they called him for jury duty I said son you, yeah we was down at the old courthouse he said dad it smells like an old courthouse yeah. 
And all the people were in there were crammed in this one room. I said, y'all have separation? Oh, no. Was anybody wearing masks? No, no. What's, what's it all about? This has been one of the greatest tactics since the Garden of Eden to put fear into the hearts and lives of people. And tonight, you need to break forth out of that and say, I will not forsake the assembling of myself together as the manner of some is, but so much the more because I see the day approaching. Can you say amen to that? Come on, stand up on your feet and give the Lord praise right there. Would you do that? Just clap your hands, all you people, and let them know how much you love and appreciate the Lord. Father, I thank you for this word tonight. I pray that you would just let it be applied to our own hearts and lives, every heart in here, my heart, Lord. I pray that we would walk better and closer with you than we ever have. Lord, we know we're, we're, we're as born-again believers, you've called us to a specific reason, and it's not uh, in a purpose. It's not for us, Lord, to drift to the left or right, but Lord, thank you for your grace that helps us to stay where we need to be so that we can, so that we can be what you've called us to be. I pray that every person in this building and those that are watching online right now, when they leave out of here, and if you allow the sun to come up tomorrow, uh, that you will use every person as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my Redeemer. And that, Lord Jesus, is my prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody believes it. Amen? Amen. 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 Shake hands and be friends with somebody around you. Love them and love the Lord. I, I, Rita, I'd like to shake your hand and just... Will you shake my hand? She won't shake my hand. <laughs> <laughs>